morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you are. I am Ira Feldman. I am the Executive Director of MEPTEC, and I would like to welcome you to the Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series, jointly hosted by MEPTEC and IMAPS. So welcome to today's presentation. Our next speaker in the series will be July 15th. Jan Vardaman will give us an update on the semiconductor market and talk about the market growth drivers. That is on July 15th at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. We'll be sending out announcements and there'll be registration links, including one on meptech.org. And then talking about additional events, uh, we have scheduled the Known Good Die workshop. This will be a full day event on Wednesday, September 16th at Semi Headquarters in Milpitas. So this is uh, currently scheduled for then. If things change, we will definitely let you know. The keynote speaker is David Greenlaw from NVIDIA, and we have technical presentations from companies such as Cisco, Adventist, Synopsys, Form Factor, Moldbauer, and others. Uh, the program can be found on kgdworkshop.org. So please uh, mark your calendars and we look forward to a great event talking about the importance of known good die. In this time of uncertainties, as uh, we, as long as well as many other organizations, we have moved our programming to a virtual format. So the good news is it allows us to reach a greater, uh, larger audience. The bad news is we're not doing our in-person events, which pay the cost of operating MEPTEC. So now more than ever, we rely on membership and sponsorships to uh, fund our organization through this difficult time. So if you haven't joined or renewed uh, your membership, uh, please do so at meptech.org. The rate is $95 per person per year. Or if your company is able to or is interested in sponsoring either some of our virtual events or upcoming live events, please let us know. Uh, questions about joining or sponsoring, please reach out to Betty B. Cooper at meptech.org. So it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce Stephen Rothrock from AT Reg, who will talk about the US China trade war, the tariff effects on the global OSAT market. We had Stephen as a speaker last year at the uh, luncheon about this time, and it was a very informative a discussion about how to pick a location for clean room and uh, fabrication facility locations. So I believe his presentation today will be equally as interesting, if not more so given the current news. Stephen uh, founded ATREG in 2000, and their mission is to help uh, technology companies divest and acquire uh, manufacturing assets that are, contain a large amount of infrastructure, such as wafer fabs, as well as uh, MEM solar and other R&D facilities. Over the last 20 years, they've been involved to about 40% of all global wafer fab sales in the semiconductor industry. And you can see they've been involved with a lot of the marquee players in the industry. Uh, prior to founding ATREG, uh, Stephen established Collier's International Global Corporate Services and was also uh, headed their US division in Seattle. Uh, so Stephen joins us today from Los Gatos. So Stephen, with that, I will turn this over to you. Thanks very much, Ira. I'll put the share screen here and see if we can get this running appropriately. Yeah, is that up? Clear? Yes. Great. Well, thank you, everybody. It's a pleasure to um, be with you again. And um, I'll, we'll jump right in knowing that time is precious for all of you. <clears throat> It's not moving. Let me see. There we go. Here's our here's our agenda for the day. Um, focus is going to be on the U.S.-China trade war and tariff impacts. And as Ira mentioned, I am the founder of 
of Atreg, the CEO. Um, we've been in the market, you know, for a long time, and our focus is really helping companies to sell infrastructure-rich semiconductor facilities or clean rooms around the world. And we've worked with many of um, leading companies in this area, both on the back end and on the on the front end side. Um, the, the company's focus is global and we have uh, a team with offices. Uh, we were established in 1998. We have offices in Seattle, in the Bay Area, and also over in Tokyo. But we've done a lot of work for companies like Renaissance and Fujitsu, uh, who we've represented in sales in Japan. We're the only team, I think, worldwide um, to have advised on the sale or acquisition of operational semiconductor fabs. <clears throat> and we've done um, a little over 100 of those. Um, our focus in terms of our work is really helping clients to address the orga their organic growth, their strategic growth, their manufacturing, and their R&D strategy. We were the first advisory firm to um, actually direct and conduct the sale of 300 millimeter fab um, for both the facility and the tools. And we've done a lot of multifaceted deals around the world. This is just uh, some tombstones of our top transactions over the last 10 years. Um, I think of note and that we take great pride in is that we have represented a lot of companies multiple times. Um, and these are companies like Texas Instruments, like Qualcomm, like Renaissance, Micron, NXP, um, we've, we've helped a lot of these companies. You'll note there's some of those companies that are no longer around today as well, Freescale and others who've been consolidated over the years. <clears throat> we, with respect to just some of our current offerings and things we're working on today, uh, which is challenging to say the least in the, in the COVID environment, we can't tour clients through. I was just telling Ira before we started this facility that we're representing for on in Belgium is a, 150 millimeter fab, it's 200 millimeter convertible. And um, we've just finished management presentations to a number of companies and we'll move towards indicative offers, but without companies having toured the facility, we've had to do it virtually with them. Uh, just some of the challenges that we've had in our, <clears throat> our market today, but this facility is automotive qualified, uh, 40,000 square feet of clean room and uh, 0.35 uh, products, CMOS, BCD, high voltage analog technologies. We're also representing a facility for Allegro in Thailand, just north of Bangkok. Again, a significant uh, facility. Uh, with respect to expansion, it, it was only built four years ago, um, but it is on a 20 acre site. There's almost 400,000 square feet there within that Allegro facility and I'll touch on it a little further in our in our discussions and then um, here within the United States we happen to uh, work with the Mohawk Valley Edge and the state of New York for a very significant 500 acre site uh, that where we put together two deals um, over the last few years most recently with Cree Wolf Speed um, this New York facility happens to be in a growing ecosystem for semiconductor where obviously Global Foundries has two of their biggest facilities on as a 300 millimeter facility, Rome, and now uh, Cree Wolf Speed. Um, <clears throat> and the, it's a region where there's 11,000 people employed within the semiconductor industry. We're hopeful to attract some other companies. We got a million square feet of space available there and significant infrastructure. Um, and I'll take maybe questions later on if, if people have any related to that. And then in Virginia, the former Kimunda site that we sold actually 10 years ago out of bankruptcy to a significant data center company who filled the 200 millimeter and the probe and test facilities with data center operations. But the 300 millimeter shell is still available. They recently purchased another 100 acres because they're doing customized data centers, um, Greenfield. Thus, we've had some interest, and I think maybe with the onshoring and the reshoring, this <clears throat> 300 millimeter facility might come back into use here within the United States. <clears throat> so, um, Stephen, before you, you go on, I forgot to mention, we want to do this in an interactive uh, 
format so people uh, who are online, if you can ask your questions to the Q&A tool, and I'll ask Stephen as he goes. So, I sure. Oh, no, thank you. Questions right away. Very happy to take questions as we go. And then this is just a few of the recent transactions we've been involved with. We had a, a big year last year um, assisting with the Cree acquisition. We also have represented on semiconductor in the acquisition of the former IBM stroke global foundries uh, Fishkill Fab. Um, and we also represented Texas Instruments selling the Greenock Scotland facility to diodes. Um, and we represented VIS <clears throat> subsidiary, obviously, of TSMC in their acquisition of the global foundries or former Hitachi Fab. It was built by Hitachi down in, in uh, Singapore. Um, that Micron facility as well was a back end facility and um, it was held as a result of the bankruptcy there for five years. And then we assisted them to sell that to PTI, keeping all of the, all of the workforce. Um, well, what underlies this trade war? Um, I don't know if some of you know Stephen Blank. He's a uh, author, teacher, uh, he's done, done a lot with lean uh, startups and entrepreneurship and innovation. He's got a highly read blog. And 10 days ago, Stephen posted this. It came out of an article he did on war, on the rocks. Um, but, you know, controlling advanced chip manufacturing in the 21st century may well prove to be like controlling the oil supply in the 20th. And the country that controls that and this manufacturing could throttle the military and economic powers of other companies. <clears throat> China is obviously considers Taiwan a province. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, you know, recently in light of what's been happening with the global dialogue between the US and China, the US just did this to China by limiting Huawei's ability to outsource its in-house in chip designs for manufacturing by Taiwan Semiconductor Corporation. And if negotiations fail in these next rounds, China may respond. They may escalate via one of, you know, a number of different agile strategic responses um, that, you know, hopefully will be short of any type of war, but succeeding and, you know, depends on coercing them to stop making chips for American companies. Have we just gotten a little more dangerous in terms of diplomatic um, interactions? Uh, Stephen or Steve Blank certainly happens to feel so. <clears throat> I wanted to just give a, a quick idea about fabs as well, back end and front end, in terms of how they come about in our world there's not a significant number of transactions, nothing close to what happens with M&A. And in the, in the <clears throat> time period over the last eight years, there were 96 transactions that took place with 30 of those being back end, 96 of those being front end. I think what's of most notice, however, is the decline that we've really had since 2015, which we attribute to the um, significant consolidation that has happened within the industry. <clears throat> I also, I think it's also important to note as I, you know, go to the next slide, the number of transactions um, that have taken place in Asia Pacific. Um, that's really the, yep. Sorry. Sorry, so um, with, with the current environment, you, you show one transaction this year. Do you think any of the others will close this year or is this sort of every, everything is stalled? No, um, actually the things have been quite robust. Um, we've been, we're, we're finishing up a 200 millimeter transaction as we speak right now, that's confidential, but you know, um, for, the, for the most part, you know, Legal work has been done and, and, and documents are moving forward on that right now. I believe that the on transaction will also get done this year, even despite the fact um, of some of the travel challenges we're having to move around. Uh, there's a significant fab in, in uh, Japan that's currently being dealt with right now. 
Um, and I think there's a good chance the Allegro facility will be will get done this year in light of the interest we're having. So it sounds so, like that portion is moving on. <laughs> okay, got it. Um, I, so anyway, just the 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 focus here on Asia, I think, is important. I think the other focus is the differential between the number of back end deals that get done and the number of front end deals that get done 70% on the, on the front end side of the equation. Um, if we turn our, our gaze a little bit to our topic and putting a spotlight back on China, I think it's important to note that China uses 61% of the world's chips in products for both its domestic and its export markets. <clears throat> they import around 310 billion. In fact, it's gone up. That was a 2018 number. And I think it's fair to say that over the last 10 plus years, China has recognized its inability to manufacture their most advanced chips. And it's been a strategic heel, which is why they've put in place um, their long-term funding to, and they're looking as we speak to raise another 23 uh, to 30 billion. The issues that are there are what's happening in our global diplomatic relations where US restrictions on Chinese telecom companies such as Huawei um, has a spillover effect into the OSAT market where order volume then goes down and I think that it's fair to say the reemergence of these trade tensions will likely drive OSAT production down further um, if, if things don't get a little bit better soon. <clears throat> but China is investing heavily within the, within the semiconductor sector. Um, and related to that investment that they've made, um, we've also noted that fabs that have not completed within China for different reasons. Some instances, municipalities or provinces, you know, going off with not a fully baked plan um, and or maybe a lack of uh, technology, IP, et cetera, to bring those, uh, those up. And um, we're seeing as well, uh, you know, a push big time on memory within China. Um, we're, we're also, you know, noting that some of the foreign companies that are in China are taking a much closer look at their manufacturing oper operations. Apple is mentioned here, but there are several other companies as well who have, uh, have you know, taken a look at things. And that said, I wanted, I just wanted to contrast it. Um, other major fabs that have gone up around the world include uh, uh, TI's expansion down in Texas, where they broke ground in May on a new 300 millimeter facility. Um, the Infineon's expansion of VLOC over in Austria um, and Bosch's facility that was announced and is now coming up in, in Dresden, Germany. With respect to China's made in China 2025 goal um, that was laid out <clears throat> 10 years ago to provide significant investments. It still remains to be seen how much of that plan will come to fruition given the current geopolitical environment. A trade war could curtail their ability to get advanced technology tools. We're seeing some of that happening right now with respect to restrictions on ASML and, and AMAT and others. Um, and it's going to be, I think, of, of real interest to see if they will meet the forecasts that they have, have set out in their plan going forward. <clears throat> So with this, you know, and I've seen similar numbers, but the, you know, if China is producing 16% of the world's ICs, you know, how does that break down in between true Chinese companies where the, 
it is a Chinese entity that um, is selling the device versus, let's say, a fab that's owned by Samsung or fab that's owned by Micron or some global brand or U.S. brand. You know, who you know who really owns? And of course, ownership in China is a little funny, but who really owns the fabs in China? That are no, that's a good, Ira, it's a good question. Um, in 2019, less than half that production, you know, uh, was done by companies headquartered in China. So the other 60% is being done by, you know, foreign companies who have got subsidiary organizations within China. And I think people are watching that, you know, very closely right now. Micron, uh, Hynix, Samsung, you know, have significant, significant facilities there. Um, Global Foundries have just, you know, recently pulled out of their Chengdu operations. So it, it's something that is in flux and it's obviously a sign that the diplomatic um, discussions and tension that is in the air is, is affecting um, the C-suite in terms of some of the decisions they're making around their manufacturing in China. And with, with such a large you know, growth projected, I mean, and the rate that they're going, is there gonna be a hockey stick from China fab capacity? Is it, are we gonna wake up and there's gonna to be tons of capacity or do they have to accelerate? Or do you think they're really gonna be able to close this gap that they're trying to close by, you know, only five years from now? I think in the middle tier for, and I'm going to say non-leading edge, I think China will, you know, close some of that capacity. Certainly they've shown their ability to do that with respect to memory products. Where they've struggled has really been in the analog you know, mixed signal, you know, MCU segments. Um, and foreign companies have really established themselves, you know, quite heavily in those markets. And it, it will, that presence of those foreign companies will make it more difficult for the domestic companies, I think, to grow in those, in those areas. So I'm giving you a kind of a 50-50 answer. Okay, that's fine. And, and we actually have a question from the audience. Um, so in terms of growth, I mean, this was specific to how many 200 millimeter fabs are you aware of being under construction or on the drawing board in China? And then maybe the, the same question for 300 millimeter. I mean, are we talking two fabs, 50 fabs? I mean, and... The 30 fabs that I referenced there were all fabs that were charted over the and, and moving forward over this last five years, eight of them, so, you know, almost a third of them, um, I think there's some big questions whether or not they will come to fruition. I think as anybody knows, um, a 200 millimeter fab is, a, is a, a real struggle today given the lack of supply of 200 millimeter tools. Um, Atrig does not sell tools on an individual basis, but we did, we do represent significant sales um, just because of our ability to run a good process. And we did take 1,200 tools out into the market on behalf of Global Foundries about a year and a half ago. 460 of those were 200 millimeter. We ended up having 37 buyers at the table um, for those 200 millimeter and 300 millimeter tools. We do have an excess of supply with 300 millimeter at the moment just because of the memory companies, you know, some of the some of what they're throwing off, but again, it's very expensive to create a 300 millimeter facility, get it up to operational efficiency, which is you know running in excess of 50, 60 thousand wafer starts, um, and a, and so there's some kinks to be worked out here in in China, I believe, to to uh, you know get up to that capacity. Uh, or, the, or to the capacity that we, you know, we, where we see TSMC at today. SMIC has made some you know, big headway. Um, there's no doubt about it, but 
still, you know, when 60% of the production in China is happening from foreign companies, um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what will happen in the next five years. I think that five-year plan may become actually a 10-year plan. Okay. So, but uh, back to the specific question. So you said there's eight fabs under construction. Are they all slated to be 300 or there, there's a mix between 200? There's a mixture, actually, Ira. And um, the, one, of the, one of the gentlemen who uh, chronologues this and spends quite a bit of time on it is a gentleman named Handel Jones. Mm -hmm. Who happens to IBS. be in the, other, yeah. in the in the Bay Area? Um, but no, they are a mixture, uh, and there's uh, there's a MEMS facility in there as well. And I think we'll we will see some <clears throat> specialty um, a couple of specialty fabs that will get off of the ground uh, coming up here in the next year or two. Thank you. No problem. Um, so let's look at the overall OSAT market and, uh, and where it's moving. It's grown you know, to a point where 28.7 billion. Um, I think very interestingly, you know, of the 100 companies that are in that space, it's really, it's fair to say it's dominated by five companies who actually control 80.6% of the, of the overall market. Um, in Q3, you know, 2019, the top 10 companies within the sector experienced 18% growth from the previous quarter. Uh, and this continued into Q1 2020. Um, but we're, we're seeing some, some turbulence out there now in respects to what is happening with COVID and the production disruptions that have been brought about by that and this global trade discussions where um, is, is certainly having a big effect in that <clears throat> just recently in the beginning of uh, Q2 in April, Fitch rating revised their outlook from stable to actually negative, um, predicting a slowdown for the rest of, um, excuse me. Oh, gotta go the right way. I think I'm just ahead. Hold on here, excuse me. <laughs> Predicting a slowdown and, um, and it's going to have an effect on the, on the OSET market as you can see on this graph, you know, where, where things are trending down. Um, I wanted to hit, however, one other area of, you know, real importance, which is advanced packaging. And <clears throat> it's going to account for roughly half of total packaging by 2024. Um, the kager on that, the compound annual growth rate is three times higher than for other packaging within the sector. And revenue is thus expected to increase by 43% by 2024 in the advanced packaging area. So we're seeing, you know, that as a, as a real bright area um, going forward. And I wanted to thank Jan, who's going to speak next week for sharing uh, sharing this uh, graph with us. Um, the, you know, expected, it's also expected that the OSAT supply chain will be severely affected in 2020. Um, and we're going to see some disruptions as a result of it. I think the slower 5G adoption and um, a longer smartphone replacement cycle due to COVID are, are one of the things that are really gonna weigh on demand going forward. Companies um, with more exposure to Chinese production facilities will also be more heavily impacted due to restrictions on those Chinese companies selling in to US companies. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna touch on that in just a minute. Um, before I do, I, I do wanna acknowledge the growth drivers that are out there. Obviously, widespread implementation of IoT, of 5G, of AI is going to drive future growth. Smartphones were the biggest customers for OSAT providers <clears throat> up to present, with more than a billion shipments every year. But the market's been saturated on the smartphone side, and it's really declining. So newer chips are being 
are being developed for the smaller players in the market <clears throat> who lack um, excuse me, testing and uh, so, packaging infrastructure. So on the uh, question was back on the advanced packaging when you were talking about that, you don't need to flip back, but do you know whether, I think that was a YOL slide, whether yeah. the, you know, what, what do they call advanced packaging? Is it flip chip? onward or is it even more advanced than just basic flip chip you know wafer level packaging and i i have to, you know? i think it is even more advanced ira <clears throat> and interestingly too you know it's going to it's really applying to the to the biggest companies who are dealing with advanced uh, technology moving down below 10 um so you're in an you're in an elite <clears throat> group there, and it's requiring you know more intent, intensive clean room environments. Um, we're also hearing that they want this closer, more closely aligned with their front end manufacturing. So we could we could see that as kind of being a push forward, and the companies that will lead that are going to be TSMC, Intel, Samsung. Um, you know, Micron are among the few who are, who will be looking at that. And we're all, we're seeing that already with Micron. They've reconfigured some of their, their spaces where they have their front and back end located in the, in the exact same locations. Um, we helped them actually with the um, analysis that they did in Taiwan on that front. But it is, it's much more advanced. <clears throat> And talking about that alignment, so not only is it technically aligned, but they want to put them co-located or, or as close to po as possible. Is that what you, you're yes. referring by yes. the alignment? Correct. Uh, an announcement by TSMC recently, uh, they just announced an $8 billion advanced assembly and test facility that they're going to be putting in, in Shinshu. Uh, in Taiwan next to where, you know, they currently have, I think uh, it's 10 or 12 um, fabs located there. I, and I think that's the trend that we'll see happening with these advanced assembly and test facilities, which will take, you know, quite high volume, I believe, um, and will be, it's a much more costly infrastructure, uh, uh, a much more robust clean room environment for them. And I'm I'm not the the engineer on that side, but I think when you next have Jan on, um, she'll she can certainly give a much more defined um, uh, focus on on the products there and some of the size parameters that they might be dealing with for these facilities because she's advising on some of those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, just moving on, looking at you know. <clears throat> the OSAT market and really who controls that market. Um, revenue by region is based often on the location of headquarters. And if you look at this by region, I think it's pretty astonishing to see that Taiwan and China control almost 75%. Um, and as stated earlier, we shouldn't forget you know, how China views Taiwan really as a province that will one day you know, as far as they're concerned, be part of China, thus creating a risk for other, you know, for corporations <clears throat> with respect to maybe future manufacturing if this diplomatic impasse, you know, continues over the long term. Um, and moving from there to just looking at the, you know, overall, you know, top 25 OSATs and looking at the, at how uh, the Chinese have really climbed up into leadership positions, we've got of the top eight OSAT companies, three of those providers, JSET, Tongfu, and, and <clears throat> Tingsha Watian, uh, all have their headquarters located in, in China. Top, he, top, top OSATs as well have got you know, heavy investments, um, and that's what's creating disparity with the rest of the pack. Um, of the companies that are kind of below that that line, and companies that are in the tail, I think it's fair to say are at a higher risk 
if there isn't, if they don't have differentiated technology or IP for either mergers, acquisitions, expansions, <clears throat> and or perhaps down the road, um, an exit strategy. And if we look at where the um, OSAT fabs are, again, interesting to note that there's a significant concentration of these facilities in China and in Taiwan um, in excess of 50, 50%. And again, um, if we're looking at you know, decreasing risks over time, that's going to be an interesting you know, reality for, for, um, for people to look at and, and to confront down the road. So if we take that, so I'm you, sorry, go ahead. Talk, you, you talked about the, the locations of the OSATs and one of the questions is, okay, if you're gonna shift out of China and you know, obviously you wanna avoid Taiwan, in what, in which we've talked about is viewed as a province of China. Where, where, where do you see these landing? You know, I mean, that's a good question. Um, we're seeing, you know, Malaysia. We're seeing Indonesia. We're seeing the Philippines um, as significant locations that companies are looking at, um, <clears throat> and it's. It's early right now, but um, we've, we have definitely seen the pause that has taken place in the C-suite of some of these, uh, of a lot of the major companies in terms of what they're doing. Um, I'm gonna hit a slide here in a minute on uh, Allegro, who really decided you know, to stop their expansion in, uh, in Thailand, and while it's not directly related to Taiwan or China, um, it is related to a desire to have a uh, to consolidate their facilities within Asia Pacific and to do it in a in a much more neutral um, location. <clears throat> so, I don't I don't have the crystal ball on that, but um, I think you will you we will start seeing some of these other locations becoming. You know more significant. Infineon are, you know, expanding in Malaysia right now. Bosch is expanding in in Malaysia right now. Um, you know, a couple of other companies um, that significant companies that I've mentioned already in the in the presentation in the top 10, 20 around the world are are looking in those um, other countries right now. Um, so. Taking a look at the U.S.-China trade war timeline and, and a recap on that, um, one has to say, okay, what has spurred this? Has it been IP? Has it been loss of manufacturing? Has it been the 5G um, integration and fear of hardware, software process infiltration? Um, is it China reunifying with Chinese claim Taiwan? I think all of these are factors that are at play in, in this and that have led us to the point that we are today. Um, and it's fair to say that on the US front, this has been building on both sides of the aisle, both for Democrats and for Republicans. The uh, Huawei ban really accelerated things, um, even though the phase one trade deal was signed in, in January. Um, it remains to be seen right now <clears throat> if, if they're going to make it, you know, to phase, to getting the phase two done um, and or seeing if this export ban um, goes through the election and into, you know, 2021. Some, some questions for all of us um, and in terms of the uncertainty that it's providing. And with that too, um, I wanted to, you know, make note of a significant event that's happened this year with TSMC um, making a decision to go into Arizona. I think we all know that they um, have ma are making so many things from computing platforms to truly, you know, some of the biggest weapon systems that are being built um, going forward. And they, sorry, I am 
come back on that. Oops, my apologies. They, uh, <clears throat> but this announcement into Arizona is a very interesting one. Um, we've been following it closely ourselves. I think it came, it, it seems as if it was a very rushed announcement. Um, while they make 60% of chips for American companies, this is gonna be a very small fab by TSMC standards, only making 20,000 wafer starts, you know, a cap, a CapEx, a, maybe a billion where, you know, a gigafab would be closer, closer to, you know, six to eight and um, creation of these jobs. Is it politically driven? I think a lot of us would say, yes, it most likely is. Um, and, and yet at the same time, I'm not sure any of us really yet fully understand the ramifications of this or what um, moved this forward at this current point in time. So to be determined, but it's a sign of um, the in political environment that we're in today and of where things are moving with the ideas around reshoring and onshoring. So, so about the TSMC, uh, you know, uh, we were chatting beforehand, but it, it seems that this is not following the normal progression of, you know, no, normally, let's say like when Amazon went looking for a new headquarters, they shopped it around to multiple states to see who would give the biggest local incentives. And usually, you know, from what we're hearing, and they, they say we've bought property. So it's like, well, why haven't they disclosed this is this is the location you know, obviously you have questions about the scale and what they're really going to be doing, but it doesn't seem to follow the normal paradigm of how a, a large corporate campus, you know, infrastructure rich facility is is located in the U.S. No, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, this came about, you know, quite suddenly. It seemed to be a real rushed announcement. Um, that was made and the size parameters don't add up for a company the size of, of TSMC. Um, and it's, I think it's, st we're still finding out what's going on behind it. I mean, typically the state of Arizona would, would have provided a significant incentive package and that would, you know, that's, pub that would be public knowledge. It's not. State of Arizona has never, you know, provided, you know, real significant packages. And I can say that from a standpoint of having represented several companies as we've looked around the nation here or the world, you know, for, for fabs, um, you know, the pre package in New York, you know, was almost half a billion and um, um, the state of Arizona has not, you know, put forward or we haven't seen in recent years, those types of packages. So, to be determined, I think, but I, I do, I, it raises the manner in which it's come about, the quickness, the lack of thought around how it's, it's been, you know, announced, the fact that no location has yet been identified, um, I think raises a number of questions. And it's going to take them two years to build this, you know, to, to get into production, you know, to get that fab up and, and tools in it and then qualified to where they're doing volume. So I think there still may, may be some, um, there's still, there still may be some surprises in this as it goes forward. Well, we may see new news or press releases in January, 2021. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. <laughs> I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. <clears throat> well, um, you know, just moving on and looking at what's happening in the current environment. I think everybody's aware in the recent weeks about the significant lobbying efforts, you know, SIA, SEMI um, have been very involved in this. Uh, and there's a bill out right now that, <clears throat> that, the, uh, that by two couple of senators and one side, a couple of senators on the other side, um, this um, $37 billion package is, is quite significant in that it would provide for a, you know, new research, it would provide for um, states to be able to get block grants. Um, it, would <clears throat> it would provide, you know, for building new semiconductor facilities. We don't yet know what 
the matches will be for the states, what percentage they'll have to match to do it, to make it equitable for all of them. But this, this bill um, has got a lot of support behind it. And um, it was put forward, I think, by Senator Mark Warner and uh, Senator Corbin out of Texas. And then um, there's another bill that came forward. That bill was called the, the uh, CHIP bill. There's another one, the American Boundaries Act. Um, on that one, Senator Schumer and Senator Cotton, Senator Reich have been involved with this. Uh, there's been price tags up as high as 100 million on this for it to be a broader technology bill. And we an, we're anticipating that one of these bills over the next 60, 90 days will very likely you know, be put into play. Then I think it becomes a question of how are those incentives you know, put out there and do they make a big difference in terms of attracting companies to build uh, new, to build green fields here within, within the United States. Um, you know, if you, if you look at companies that might consider doing that, obviously Cree is a, is a good, uh, is a, it's a good telltale sign. The Texas Instruments announcement of their facility in, in Texas is also a, a very good sign on having, you know, purchased a 300 millimeter here in the U.S. is a good sign. Global Foundries is on a roll and, and has been very strong, just purchased for more land up in, uh, Upstate New York, obviously, which would be for potential, you know, expansion. Um, and I anticipate, we anticipate Micron, uh, you know, might look at further expansion here within the U.S. <clears throat> so, so um, you know, at the finished product level, the EMS level, you know, where we saw the Foxconn uh, facility basically evaporate, um, but, you know, the argument's always been that you need to have this really extensive supply chain to make things practical, let's say at the, the product assembly level. But if we, we go back to both the fab level and the back end level, you know, the fab level, we've demonstrated that we can build out the supply chain. But mm -hmm. the, at the OSAT level, is there enough of a supply chain available in the U.S. close enough responsive? responsive enough with the right materials to really support these advanced materials. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, the advanced materials required for advanced packaging. Sure. I think there are some areas where that can certainly be done. Um, you do have, you know, I, I mean, obviously with Intel being in Arizona and in Oregon, you've, you've got um, significant presence in both of those states, a significant infrastructure. It's, it's, it's no longer really there within California, but it does exist within Texas, you know, in the Austin area. Um, and it does exist over on the East Coast, kind of between that Washington, New York corridor. Um, New York has, has put a lot of time and energy into um, this, you know, it's gone through five, six administrations. Um, they've supported it, whether Republican or Democratic, um, the facility in Virginia. Um, there's there's a, a little bit down in Florida, um, <clears throat> and they'd like it. I think it to be to be more there. I think we do have, you know, the supply chains. They're not as robust as they are in Southeast Asia, um, and in China. It's fair to say that yes. Um, there's there's. But I think as things move to a more advanced stage, I think as companies look at the, the risk analysis situation there, and as they as these things move closer to, you know, front end fabs, um, there's a case to be made that this could they they could happen in the United States, um, and I think this bill will test that a little bit. I think a number of um, Corporate management teams will, you know, look very closely at this, saying, "Gosh, if, I'm, if I have an ability to write off 40% of my equipment, um, which is significant, um, and if I'm in an area where I've got a good ecosystem, could could I could this pencil well, you know, looking ahead for the next 10 to 20 years? So we'll see. So nothing in the the bills are directly. I mean, 
uh, the way you describe it, and this is based upon a question that was just asked, the bills are all benefiting sort of the front end, the foundry. I mean, there's nothing specific about the OSAT portion of it, but you did you just say that they could tie that off? Uh, some of the incentives could apply there, but is there anything specific in these bills for the OSAPs? No, Ira, that's another really good question. I am not an expert on it. They've only recently, they've just really truly come out here in the last you know, couple of weeks and, and that's some stuff we're trying to drill down on right now. Um, but I would think that that would be left open in terms of how that could be used. And I know that there's a portion of the funding here, which is for the government and for military use where they really do need back end assistance um, and support. So, and they want that here in the United States. And I, I believe some of these funds will apply to that, but I don't, I can't tell you what portion. Got it. <clears throat> um, just, you know, looking at what, you know, what has been happening uh, in terms of, you know, people moving out of markets. I mentioned this facility at the beginning, but, um, and I mentioned just previously that, you know, Allegro are really consolidating. And this, this is probably one of the premier assembly and test facilities, you know, built four years ago, um, built at a, you know, <clears throat> two and a half meters above the normal level that it would need to be so that there's never a problem of flood flooding or anything else. But they just took the view that we need to centralize into one location. And they've done that in a, in a, um, outside of Thailand. So an, an interesting example, um, and one I reached for quickly as I was putting this together. I also wanted just to touch, you know, briefly on the China tariff, um, US-China tariff impacts on the OSAT market. And while the US, you know, is taking a new tact, I think it's fair to say that <clears throat> China will probably only increase their decoupling between the US and China. And this could lead to a significant decrease in the US market share. And for the past five years, China's obviously embarked on their massive fab building plan, but they've struggled to complete all of them with you know, eight out of the 30 still not done. Um, but all of that said, um, <clears throat> SMIC have, have established a strong base. Um, and China overall um, has, you know, become prominent in several areas like memory. Uh, but as we look at it going forward, um, we are, <clears throat> we see that um, Chinese, you know, technology companies like Huawei, um, who have who have come in and taken such a dominant place, um, are are going to they'll. They're going to focus in on utilizing the resources that they have within China. Uh, SMIC, I believe, is you know now providing a majority of their chips, given the restrictions that have been placed on them. <clears throat> We're seeing uh, um, High Silicon, uh, a subsidiary of Huawei, you know, has already become one of the largest customers for TSMC's most advanced technology, even to the point of beating out Apple in terms of uh, demand. And if implemented, there's a belief that the regulations the U.S. is imposing here could cost U.S. chip makers something to the tune of, of $36 billion in revenue, which is, you know, very, very significant in light of um, this industry and the interdependence that has existed for a number of years. <clears throat> Looking also at, you know, what's happening with uh, respect to M and A, the uh, the OSAT sector's forecast for compound annual growth, as I mentioned previously, has been six percent, and that's what is expected to happen between 2020 and 2025. And alone, it's it's propelled. It's been it's increased demand for automotive subsystems, for connected devices, for IoT, and those products are overtaking smartphone, the smartphone market, and are going to be the, the products of the future um, 
that establish this. And those companies who are able to expand into those markets through M&A, through some more consolidation, are, are going to be the winners within this industry. And much as we've seen it on the front end side, I think we're, this next five years, we're, um, we're going to see quite a bit of M&A and consolidation on the, on the back end side. <clears throat> so coming to a conclusion and looking really at key takeaways, um, onshoring and reshoring is a prominent topic in Washington DC today. The U.S. wants to maintain its lead in technology, which means they've got to be putting in more investment and providing for greater incentives. It means supporting companies that are either relocating facilities from overseas or seeking ways to blunt the edge of rivals <clears throat> who've supposedly gained from moving to China. Will these bills be enough? I think, you know, that remains to be seen, um, much like a lot of things in the COVID environment right now and given the economic situation that we have, will a new administration follow on the same course? Um, also a question, although it's fair to say that the Obama administration before they left had es established their PCAST report and had identified a lot of this stuff. And in 2012, in fact, uh, the House committee was looking into Huawei so um, they've certainly had some experience with this. And at the end of the day, I think the biggest unknown is how will China respond moving forward? <clears throat> the, um, the dramatic drops in the US, in the US semiconductor revenue would, if they happened, they would lead to more severe cuts in R&D for companies um, and to capital expenditures, which would, which would be a, a real, loss. And if there were dramatic drops in U.S. semiconductor revenue, it would also lead to potentially the loss of, you know, 15 to 40,000 highly skilled direct jobs in the, in the U.S. semiconductor industry. Um, not something I think this administration or the semiconductor industry um, worldwide would like to see. But it's fair to say these are big issues. Um, these are um, big time stakes uh, that are being gambled with in light and with the diplomatic war that's going on currently. So I'll leave it there and, um, and finish with any other questions that people might have. So I'm going, to, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to launch a poll so if people could take a moment to fill that out just to give us some feedback on uh, Stephen's presentation and this uh, series. Uh, I know we're almost at the hour, but we can take a few questions. Um, may, may, maybe the short version, if the, 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 the elevator answer, I, I know you touched upon this in your, your key takeaways, but uh, the specific question is, at the end of the day, who do you think would win, quote, and I know, I know winning has multiple definitions, but who would be the overall winner in the trade war if we don't have a change in course moving forward as it relates to the semiconductor industry? You know, I have to think from a, this industry, as we all know, has moved to the forefront in the world today um, because of Moore's law. And because of that <clears throat> constant doubling and going to to finer and finer geometries and the, the the broad breadth and depth of products that have been made that we all now are incredibly dependent upon really is dependent upon technology advancement and um, <clears throat> while china as a government can provide significant um, wealth and capital investment into companies i think it does take the ingenuity that comes from company, from people and companies doing what they do best in their specific area. You know, stick to your knitting, as we typically say. And I think on the technology side, um, <clears throat> China will lose out <clears throat> on this. Um, 
And I think the open environment that's existed for the last 40 years have, have led to a lot of those developments. Um, and if, if borders shut and sharing shuts and manufacturing you know, becomes very isolated, um, we'll all lose out at, at, you know, at the end of the day. Um, so it's a, it's a great question, Ira. Um, but I do think technology will trump uh, for over the long term, the companies that are able to make those advancements and really find that leading edge product, product you know, put forward significant R&D uh, to do it. Those, those companies will, will stay at the forefront and be providing those innovative products we'll be using in 10, 20 years. Okay. Um, and then related, wow, <laughs> the questions are pouring in. So uh, we'll, we'll go for a few more minutes and we thank people who have tuned in today and uh, certainly hope that you come back on uh, July 15th to hear Jan Vardaman, but let's just tackle a few more. Um, how, how do the EU semiconductor companies fit into this, the, in, into the trade? Mm. <laughs> Great question. I lived in France for four years. I lived in London <clears throat> for seven. And, uh, and I think we've done 15, 18 deals over in Europe. You know, they had a very big initiative under one of their significant EU senators. Her name was Ellie. I'm forgetting her last name, but they put forward some significant money. They had an initiative not unlike China's related to 2020. And surprisingly, many of the senior management in a lot of the semiconductor firms said, I appreciate it, but I still, it doesn't make a dent in what I can do in terms of putting my manufacturing over in Asia. And, uh, and that's where it went, you know, for them. Europe has really not moved significantly other than the, the VLOC uh, Austria expansion by Infineon and uh, you know, ST's doing a bit in Agrate, and then Bosch's new fab and, and Global Foundries expanded their Dresden fab. But that's kind of been it. And um, we've scratched our head about that a few times too. You know, we've wondered, we wonder if with these new incentives in the United States, might the European companies who have such a strong presence and discreet and, and specialty and if they might consider coming over into into the United States to take advantage of some of these incentives, um, I think that's to be determined. So you know, may, maybe it's more than just you know the incentive. I mean, the incentives help make find you know things more attractive. But at the end of the day, is it really come down to the labor rate for skilled labor? I mean, I mean. The, there's an upfront cost of you know the the land and the facility, but at the end of the day, does the operational cost r you know really drive the selection? And and one person was asking, well, if it's about the labor rate, would Mexico be a better choice than mm -hmm. the U.S.? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. Ten years ago, it was about the labor rate, but in the last ten years, that eastern band of China has risen to become fairly comparable with, you know, Singapore and other, you know, um, you know, the United States and other areas here. I, and as we've advanced from a technology standpoint, you know, we have seen more and more automation come into the industry. I think it's, it's more about the supply chain that has built up. And I think one of the reasons for that Asia dominance has been that they've, you know, um, as it was going offshore for, you know, lack of a better term, 20, 30 years ago, which a lot of people believe was in response to the EPA, you know, coming into um, force and to a point where they had to put the teeth in their bills where they made CEOs liable for you know, anything that happened. And a lot of CEOs said, I can't accept that type of liability and they moved that manufacturing offshore, but they really established their ecosystems. And I think that's been the biggest driver for Asia. You know, Taiwan puts up a fab probably every couple months. You know, here in the US, we're doing it every couple of years. You know, they're that 
whole wheel on the construction side and you know moves very fluidly and they can they can do it in nine months where it's going to take us you know 16 to kind of get that shell out and everything else so um that's those are some of the differences that i think are there but maybe as we've advanced to the level that we've advanced today with and the needs for ip protection and technology advancement um i think i think other countries can get back into this game um you know or i should say other regions that have had semi can can look at strengthening you know what they are doing uh with respect to their manufacturing output thank you um there's a bunch of other questions but i i think we we've uh you know we've, we've covered a lot of ground i thank you very much Stephen, for presenting let me uh for those who didn't get their questions answered, I'm sure you can reach out to Stephen. His email address is there on the slide. Um, and look forward to people continuing the discussion at future events. You know, it's all, you know, it's more than theoretical. It has a big impact on our day-to-day -day lives uh, professionally. But, you know, looking at the, the geopolitics is always very fascinating because it's not always about the technology it's you know politics and the business that may impact the business mm -hmm. decisions made so thank you stephen thanks very much ira appreciate it one our next <clears throat> presentation is on july 15th jan vardaman will talk about the market growth drivers and we look forward to seeing you then if you would like to uh, present at a future webinar or luncheon, please contact myself or Dave Town, and we'd be very happy to hear from you. So thank you, and I will wish everybody a good rest of your day.